Essentially, the son, he's an adult son, reaches an male, um, adult male, takes his inheritance, asks his dad for his inheritance, and then leaves, right? He takes in, basically takes all the money, takes all the stuff, takes all the land and the cattle, kind of wants his cut, and leaves. But when he, especially in the ancient Middle Eastern culture, when do you actually get your inheritance? After the father dies. Right? So immediately from the first verse of that story, this is a deeply kind of offensive, subversive, subversive and scandalous story, because he's asking for it before his dad can die, Right? So it's very, very not, it's, it's, it's him taking the stuff of the father and saying, I know how this works better than you, and I'm going to go do what I want with it. Essentially, again, it's a metaphor for all of us in this earth. God created sex, he knows how it works best in his context. God created relationship and blessing and all these different gifts on this world, food. He knows how things are meant to be, and in this context, you can enjoy them to their fullest. But we say, no, I'm good, I'll just take your stuff, all this creation, I don't want the creator. And so the son says that. And he leaves, and then immediately he wastes it. He says, I know how to do this on my own, and spoiler alert, it doesn't go well. It doesn't go well for him. He wastes it away in some sense. Now, some of us do that fast, and some of us do that slow, but usually all of us get to that in one point in our life. Where us as the king of our own life, or the queen of our own life, please, um, we realize it just doesn't go where we actually thought it was going to go. It almost like we got there, and it just kind of didn't deliver on the promise that it was giving us before we went there. Right? And so that's the lie we see. He takes it, it doesn't go well for him, and then he finally gets to this place of like feeling like, man, my choice is caught up with me. Again, minor or major. I don't want us to just think that it's just something crazy. Everyone makes self oriented, selfish, egotistical decisions at some level. What's best for us, what we think is good, what we think is right. 
that a lot of times is actually not the best decision. And so he makes that choice, and he finally realizes the brokenness of those decisions, and then we get into this part of the story, and I'll read and finish up. But that's the context, and then it says this. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my fa father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise, and I will go to my father, and I will say to them, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father, but when he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, ran, embraced him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. In this last couple of verses, but the father responds and says to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring a fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this was my son who was dead and he is alive. He was lost and he's found, and they began to celebrate. So just to summarize that as we end, what does he say? The son comes home, and what happens? Does the father, it says the father sees him where? Does he remember the phrase? Oh, Far off, a long way off. Now, how do you see someone a long way off? Not a trick question. If you're looking for them, right? Like, you don't see someone a long way off if you're just, like, inside, hanging out with their back to them, you know, watching the ladies or something like that, right? No, you see someone that a long way off, you're actually on the porch of your house saying, where are they? What cool and you there? Are you guys all right? Can I get some therapy? Um, totally just joking. Coffee down. Um, you see someone a long way off if you're on the porch of the house saying, where are they? What a cool picture of God the Father. Because again, when I was in your guys' context, the main reason I thought I didn't care about Jesus is because to me, I did that, that's not what I heard or understood, or that's not what actually I saw when I kind of was thinking about it. That God is actually this Father looking for you, pursuing you, coming after you, and especially being raised by a single mom. That has actually some serious wounds in my life, right? Where I don't know a dad like that. I don't have a dad like that. So to hear that the creator of the universe is actually running after me in some sense is crazy. So it says he sees him a long way off, and then what's he do? He's after him. Runs, embraces him, and kisses him. Now again, ancient Middle Eastern, first century Jerusalem, over in Israel, that's an honor-shame culture. Like when you're an adult male, you're very, it's very about your honor and kind of your composure. So it's deeply actually disrespectful and shameful for adult Hebrew men to run in the first century. It kind of brought on this kiddishness or this... You know, like it's, um, you're uncomposed in some sense. I always think that's hilarious, too, because I totally think that should be an American rule. If you've seen our dads run, you're like, yeah, please stop. That's awkward. Okay. Um, <laughs> but he was willing to kind of look foolish, is what I'm saying. This dad didn't care about his standing in the city or the town or the village. He was willing to look ridiculous and foolish and reckless, in some sense, to go after his son. So he goes to him, not the son comes to him. And then when he gets there, it says he runs and brings him and then kisses him. Right? And by the way, the son just came from the pigsty, right? And actually said the pigs were doing better than him, which means I don't think he's taken a shower in a while. Right? Yeah. He's filthy. Probably literally smells like pig crap. Can I say that? You're like, okay. Um, <laughs> like literally, right? Just you know, he's, he's a mess. And yet the father, in the mess, embraces him. Gets filthy with him. Right? When you hug someone who's disgusting, and I mean like it smells like really gross, you, you can tell me, right? There's an intimate transfer that happens when there's that intimate relationship. And he says, I'm going to hug you in your mess and in your filth. What a beautiful picture, again, of the God that Jesus talks about. The Father Jesus talks about. That he hugs us in our mess and embraces it. And even better so, actually takes it on himself. It's almost like he says, I'll take the burden. <clears throat> I'll take the mess. I'll take the dirt, the shame, the guilt, you know, things that have been done against you, that you're ashamed of, things that you have done that you don't even want to think about, things that will be done in the future, same thing. And he embraces that. And what's crazy is that actually is so scandalous for that actually to play out like that, and yet the son still misses the point. Like, that's not how it should have played out ever if you do that scenario a hundred times, right? It's weird that the dad did that. And what's the son still say once all that unravels? He says, he looks down, he says, I'm not worthy to be a son. Treat me as one of your servants. And this is the point I want to end on. He essentially misses the ferocious, <coughs> reckless, incredible, amazing display of grace and love from his father because he's so concentrated on almost like his own, like repentance is like a big churchy word for his own way of coming back to the father, right? Like, I'm not good enough. And the father kind of says, who cares? Let's party, right? Let's actually celebrate. Do you know, even though it's weird because we, a lot of us think that Christianity is a fat buzzkill and it's terrible and the minute you actually follow Jesus, it's going to be no fun. Do you realize that Jesus, every time he actually wants to describe what he's like and what his movement is like, he says things like a wedding feast, a party, a celebration, an incredible dinner? That sounds awesome. He doesn't say it's a prison, it's a jail cell. He doesn't do that. It's actually, if you want fullness, he says, come here. He says, I'm not worthy of a son, make me one of your 
his servants. And that's really interesting to me because I think he's essentially saying, I don't want to be a child of yours. I want to be an employee of yours. And so many of us, that's how we try to relate to God, is it not? Like, we don't, we don't want to be a child because that's too vulnerable or we don't understand it or whatever it is. We want to work for him or do the right things. Or, and if we don't do the right things, then we just, what, what happens if an employee doesn't do the right thing? They get fired. They get fired. How many of us actually think that's what God's like? If you just mess up bad enough, now I'm good. See you later, Bob. You're fired. Have you ever seen that in a family? I hope not, right? Little Johnny spills fruit loose on the floor. Oh, you stupid idiot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Give me your hand, Jay. Yeah, yeah. Take your last hand. See you later. Why? Because a child is an identity you have, not an activity you do. Does that make sense? You are given a last name as a gift. You now become someone different, and you did nothing to get that last name. You're in the family. You can still mess up for sure, right? And you can still take a left turn here when you shouldn't have, et cetera, with life choices. But when you're in the family, like I, I, I have a sister who's older than me and had a season as well, so some, some serious poor choices. And I remember no one got my mom's attention and like thought and just like angst of like my mom wrestling over it more than my sister in that season. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Meaning, rather than firing her into trouble, a lot of times parents actually die double down on the person who's struggling, right? The good kids actually almost get no attention when the other sibling's doing that, right? What a, what a beautiful picture of the father's heart, right? That that is the father that Jesus comes to reveal to you, revealed 2,000 years ago and is still revealing to this day. And so that's what I want to end with is if you can think about God in your journey, what you've heard about him or how you grew up or what your parents were like, whether it's good, bad, etc. We all have baggage, right? Do you understand that he's not looking for employees, he's looking for children? And that's actually what joy is at. Because when you're a child, you can then be fully vulnerable and open and honest. And you can take off the mask that all of us especially wear in high school, right? I remember. Why? Because when you're a child, you don't have to hide anymore. There's no fear of being fired or let go or the name tag or the uniform being given back. When you're a child, you can actually be honest. And that's not what we're all looking for, to be known deeply and to know as well. And to understand that who we actually are, not in the good days, but also in the bad days, is actually who God wants to know and wants to see. And so that's my invitation for you tonight, wherever you're at on this journey. Right? If you're like me and you're in this room and you can care less about what I just say, I hope maybe in a couple years if something happens, maybe you'll think back on it. Right? Or maybe tonight is that night where you really say, man, I'm actually in. I have a burden. I have a weight. I have a shame. I have a guilt. Understand that Jesus relieves that. In the same way the Father embraces, he embraces you and relieves that from you. And then puts the robe on you, the ring on your hand, and the shoes on your feet, which in that culture literally just meant sonship. Like it wasn't a gradual, like, yes, you take out the trash, yes, you take a shower, then you have a son again. It's literally the son comes home, son. And all the signifiers with that instantly, and then he says, let's just open the out. No. What does he say? Let's party. Let's celebrate. God is inviting us to a feast. Think of this dinner table that's just incredible and amazing. The best meal you've ever had. That's a beautiful picture of what it means to actually walk with Jesus. Your greatest and deepest desires that you were created for, that you're trying to find in all those ridiculous things in high school, whether that's in sex, or porn, or alcohol, or you're just thinking you're popular, or trying to be in relationships that'll fulfill you, whatever it is, that's the toilet water. It fulfills on this level, sure. I'm not going to say it doesn't, but you weren't created for the toilet water, and you weren't created to live in the desert. You're created to come home. Let me pray for you guys, and then we dismiss. Father, thank you so much for this group. Thank you so much for every single one of the stories in this room, knowing that there's a complexity of those in this room. There's a variation of stories in this room. Everyone's in a different part of their journey, Lord, but I pray that at some part in our life, and hopefully tonight, if, so, if they haven't, they would come home. They would understand that your voice is a voice of grace and love, pursuing us, running after us, no condemnation, and saying, my arms are open, would you put that on me? Would you put the mess and the hurt and the burden on me? And then on top of that, let's party. You say, let's celebrate. And so God, I thank you so much for every story in this room, every person in this room. I pray anyone who's specifically, specifically going through a very tough time, a struggle, a burden of sorts, that you would give them an extra palpable sense of your peace, your love, and you are a person who we can know face to face that you would just talk to them, be with them, and that we would all know your love in a deep way. See you in your prayer. Amen. Amen.